Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania bis zum Sahel, zu Afghanistan, zu Irak, zu Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Olga Olikern, speaking to you from Brussels. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope, a few kilometers away from Olya, but also in Brussels. So as we record this on Thursday, the 5th of November, the world is awaiting news of a final result in the U.S. election. And we're hopeful that by the time you're listening to us, uh, we'll have an answer. We'll post this podcast on Tuesday, but we don't know for sure. So to talk about what it all might mean for Europe and the future of European foreign policy, whoever is president of the United States, we got very lucky because we managed to convince Natalie Tochi to join us to talk about it all. Natalie has for a long time advised the European Union's top diplomats. She's now, she's also the director of the Rome-based think tank Instituto Affari Internazionali, and she's an honorary professor at the University of Tübingen. She also writes a monthly column for Politico that you can check out. So Natalie, thank you so much for joining us. Lovely being with you. So Natalie, does it matter really who wins in the United States for the future of European security and foreign policy? Well, I mean, obviously in some respects it it matters tremendously. I mean, what we have lived through over the last four years is a president that has considered Europe in general and the European Union in particular particular, almost as public enemy number one, perhaps alongside Xi, and certainly, I would say, a not down from Putin. So clearly, yes, it does matter a lot, because not only has the European Union and Europeans in general not had the partner and ally with whom we're so used to working with on different, you know, sort of conflicts and crises around the world, but also this has been a United States that has not only looked at the European Union as an enemy, but multilateralism as an enemy. And this is basically a sort of part and parcel of the European DNA. It's the way in which Europeans do things in the world. And they have not been able to do so with the United States. From the weakening of the UN system, the US pulling out of UNESCO or or UNRWA, WHO, to the sanctioning of the International Criminal Court, to the pulling out of the Paris Agreement. So, I mean, you know, we know what the long list of issues are. And, And basically, sort of, yes, it matters tremendously because with a Biden administration, the EU would have a partner once again. With the second Trump administration, obviously, it would continue not. But then, of course, there are other elements in which it matters slightly less. I think regardless of who wins in the United States, we are going through a historical phase of, in a sense, relative decline or relative readjustment of the US's role in the world because other powers are on the rise and because the United States is going to be principally preoccupied with the major power which has already risen, meaning China. And that is where the main strategic preoccupation is going to be. It's not going to be in and around Europe. And this is something that will remain unchanged regardless of who is the president of the United States. In fact, in some respects, one can even argue that the US-China confrontation is going to become even more acute under a Biden administration because presumably a Biden administration would be less tempted to sort of strike the deal with the authoritarian leader that President Trump has had an inclination for. I mean, less of a success in doing, but certainly the inclination has been there. And a Biden administration would take more at heart some of the human rights issues that such a prominent aspect of the relationship with China, you know, from the domestic human rights situation to the situation in Hong Kong, Taiwan. So in some respects, we can imagine that under a Biden administration, that confrontation would deepen, which of course does put Europeans in a difficult predicament in many respects. So I would say, yes, we could have a partner in multilateralism again. So that is a fundamental change. But some of the structural features underpinning U.S. foreign policy would probably remain the same. But can I push back on this a little bit? Has the U.S. been such a great partner in multilateralism and has it been such a fantastic partner to Europe. Donald Trump certainly takes things or has taken things to extremes, but the general U.S. view of Europe, I would argue, is that on the one hand, it's very important to have allies, and on the other hand, we're not sure we can trust them. That's uh, the Democrats as well as the Republicans, that there's always been this frustration with Europe. 
And I kind of wonder how much good has the U.S. really been doing Europe over the last 15 years or so, Trump or no Trump? Well, I mean, I would say that if we kind of rewind back before Trump and we look at the Obama administrations, I mean, I think in fairness that Europe and the United States did work together on a number of issues. I think that the cooperation over the Paris Climate Agreement was significant. I think that the cooperation over the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, was significant. And these are both instances of multilateralism in practice, both in a sense, minilateralism and broader multilateralism. So I think that, yes, it has made a difference. Then as to the question of, I mean, obviously, the United States has always been, I would say, ambiguous about some of these issues. So it's always been, you know, we go along with multilateralism so long as it sort of serves our interests. Which isn't unusual. It's not just the US that does that. No, it's not just the US that does it. Of course, the US has more of a power to pursue that opportunism compared to others. So I would say that in some respects, and then it comes to this more perhaps European question, the more specific question about the US approach to European security and particular European defense. And there, I think also there has been a degree of ambiguity over the years. So there's been sort of lots of complaining about Europeans having to step up to the plate more and having to spend more on defense. And you can't simply sort of think that the United States is going to pay your security and defense indefinitely. Then this has been obviously sort of spelled out in a very acute and sort of brash way under the Trump administration. But, you know, let's kind of rewind back to 2011. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, in his last speech in Brussels before his resignation, being really quite tough with Europeans on some of these issues. So on one hand, there is this kind of appeal to do more on defense. And on the other, when Europeans do start moving in this direction, (laughs) there is a sort of, you know, the United States sort of pulling them back. Do more, but not that. Yeah, do you want you to do more, but can you just hold off and wait until we tell you what to do? Exactly. But I think in fairness, the way in which this sort of pulling back has been done under the Trump administration and in previous administrations, I mean, if we take sort of Obama backwards, has been very different. So in the case of sort of all previous administrations pre-Trump, the pulling back was a, yes, we want you to take greater responsibility, but we want you to do it without severing ties with us. So remaining within the same framework, commitment to NATO, etc. In the case of the Trump administration, it's been done in a fundamentally sort of mercantilist way. So it is, yes, you've got to spend more on defense, but you really have to spend more on defense as a way of rebalancing a trade imbalance with the United States. So yes, you have to spend more on defense. And uh, thanks very much. You have to spend on US defense industry. So it has not been out of any commitment to alliances and partnerships. It has basically been yet another way to try and get at your Europeans uh, for the trade imbalance with the United States. But Natalie, what about the European side of this partnership? I mean, because I remember the the old idea of European soft power being the great contribution of Europe, uh, the force multiplier for uh, all the uh, human rights and rule of law agendas. And I still remember 20 years ago sitting in Damascus and feeling that soft power, talking to diplomats who felt that Syria was being attracted into the orbit of European set of values and norms. You've written about Europe still having a moment to come of age, but maybe is it not past already? Well, yes, it's past already, but because because the world has changed. The European soft power debate was embedded in a world in which the so-called international liberal order, in which it was a given that the world was headed in one direction. And there may have been different ways of getting there and different time frames for getting there, but everyone would sooner or later get to the Holy Land. And the Holy Land being a land of human rights and democracy and rule of law and all good things. And that world, uh, those certainties have gone. And I think I really quite strongly believe that China is the main aspect of the story, because even during the Cold War, I mean, let's face it, no one really thought that it was kind of better to live under a Soviet system in terms of not only rights, but also economic prosperity and a number of different aspects that make up the good life. Yeah. So there was never really the illusion that that was the case, I think, neither in the Soviet Union nor in the West. I think the difficulty of the historical moment that we're living in as liberal democracies, and so this applies as much to Europe as to other liberal democracies, is that it is not, it may be obvious to uh, 
us yeah, in this conversation, but it's not necessarily obvious to the rest of the world that, you know, democracy is the worst political system apart from all alternatives. It is not necessarily as obvious to everyone anymore because economic prosperity can be achieved without political rights. Because as this pandemic is demonstrating, there may be other forms of governance that may be more effective in eradicating a pandemic. So we as Europeans are in a difficult spot. So it is as much a question of protecting our political systems, uh, our rights, uh, our rule of law, our democracies, as much as promoting it uh, elsewhere. So whereas in the past, in the past that you were referring to, Hugh, this was the soft power past. It was past in which it was all about promotion. And now it is as much about protection as of promotion, because as liberal democracies, we're going to be living not necessarily in an illiberal world, but I would say in a non-liberal world in which liberal and illiberal powers are going to coexist and they're going to be making their case. Yeah, the European leaders, uh, I presume, are conscious of the way that everyone else is playing hardball. I mean, all over the world, people are reaching for the guns, aren't they? In Azerbaijan, in Ethiopia, in Libya. How is Europe ever going to really uh, contest on those playing fields? Well, I mean, it's not going to contest on those playing fields, obviously, in the same way. But I think there are ways in which Europeans can and probably should already be doing more in that in that sphere. You know, we sort of spend a lot of time in Europe in kind of writing documents about, and I'm a culprit in this, about strategies and sub-strategies and implementation plans and action plans and preparing ourselves for the crisis that will come. Well, hey, the crises have already come. <laughs> and, and, what, and what do we do? And, and the truth is that to do some of the things that I personally think would be useful to do, we actually already have the capabilities. So if we take, for example, the case of Libya, what has happened in Libya? Well, we've kind of, you know, for a number of years uh, said how important it was to support the government and national accord. And we said it and then we said it again and then we said it one more time and we did absolutely nothing. And in the meantime, others were doing things. And those others, of course, started off as being you know, UAE and Egypt and then Russia and then, hey, Turkey. Turkey came along and through a balance of forces, we got to where we are today. And where we are today is a place which I think could go in two diametrically opposite directions. It could go the Nagorno-Karabakh route, meaning a ceasefire that goes nowhere in terms of consolidating peace and that simply buys time for the next war. And that is the direction of travel uh, if Turkey and Russia sort of do their thing and go their way and we do nothing. Or it could be a ceasefire that eventually does sort of open the way to a reconciliation. And given that it's not going to be the United States that is going to be stepping in here, is this something that we as Europeans should be doing? What does it mean? Well, it means being prepared to go in with a ceasefire monitoring mission, which fine would be civilian, but hey, Libya is still a fairly dangerous place. So would it need some force protection? Yes, it probably would need some force protection. Is it something that would have to be done alone? No, we can do it with the United Nations, with the African Union. Hey, we can even do it with the League of Arab States. And if Turkey wants to join in, they're happy to do so. So it's not something that we have to be doing alone, but it is something something that we should be willing and we are already able to do. So this is not about having God knows what capabilities that we don't have, but it does require accepting risk. And accepting risk means accepting body bags returning home. Because if you go to a different, difficult sort of security environment, this is a risk that, that you do run. And I think this is the psychological leap that as Europeans were still unwilling to do because we have had the luxury, and this is why we come back to the United States, States that others have, have taken that risk for us. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we are talking about uh, European foreign policy and its future with Natalie Tochi. So this really does bring up the question of what an independent, autonomous European course of action looks like, which in turn begs the question of what are Europe's foreign policy priorities? What does it want, say, from Turkey? What does it want from Russia? I mean, I would say that sort of so first to begin with the autonomy piece and then with the sort of objectives piece. I mean, you know, to me, autonomy means, in a sense, what the Greek etymology of the word suggests. Huh? So this is about the self. It's about 
auto. And it's about nomos. So it's about the self living by its laws. And those laws are domestic, they're European, and they're international laws. So we have to be able, we have to have the capability basically to do that in security terms, in economic terms, in energy terms, in digital terms, etc. So that, I think, is the direction of travel. And then I come to the goals question. It is about what is it, this self, that you want to protect through your laws? What is our identity? And here, I think, you know, it is about essentially sort of defining a European interest, which is actually deep down not that difficult to define. So it is about the resilience of our democratic system. It is about the security of our citizens. It is about our economic prosperity. So it's not, you know, it is about sort of the rule of law, both internally and internationally, because as Europeans, we are kind of small fish, yeah? So we sort of have a fundamental interest, I would say an existential interest, in setting up some laws that govern the life in the jungle. I think that is fundamentally what our interests are. And I think we share them as, as Europeans. And then one has to sort of, you know, go down to the specific questions. So as you say, you know, what does this mean with respect to Russia? What does it mean with respect to Turkey? And of course, there will be different and more nuanced answers to each one of those questions. But I think it's important to start with the basics. And the basics are what are our broadly defined European interests. And I don't think they're that difficult to define. Okay, so what does it mean, say, with respect to Belarus? Well, I think with respect to Belarus, this is about, yes, on the one hand, we want to make sure that this remains articulated as a problem that has to do with democracy and human rights and the rule of law. We don't have an interest in geopoliticizing this question. Now, of course, the problem sort of kicks in when Russia has geopoliticized. Or Belarus has, I mean, arguably Lukashenko did the most to politicize it, no? Absolutely. I think that with many of these questions, we simply have to stick the course. I do think that moving forward on sanctions was the right thing to do, which doesn't necessarily mean that we have an interest in a revolutionary change. We have a, an interest in, in whatever change the better as people decide to go. But we want to ensure that uh, that evolution or, or revolution, whatever it is, does reflect what the people want. And we want to make sure that we support the people of Belarus. So I think it's about, yes, reaching out for dialogue as much as it's about sanctions, as much as it's about supporting civil society. But without the illusion that this is something that we have the magic wand to fix from one day to the next. Natalie, you've been very clear about what credible and uh, plausible goals might be, but you've also spoken about direction of travel. Is Europe really moving towards a more autonomous state of affairs? I mean, the Belarus example is one where most analysts seem to say that not much was done because of great divisions within the European Union. And it seems from an outside perspective that actually there's a disaggregation of the European Union, internal autonomously generated values and even membership going on. I mean, you've been high up in the European Union for five or six years. Do you see a direction of travel that's going towards greater unity or do you think it's actually in danger? If we look at this from a sort of broad historical perspective, I think that the direction of travel is actually a positive one. I mean, let us recall the divisions within the EU in 2002, 2003 over the war in Iraq. So those were divisions that completely paralyzed the Union. In fact, there was no, let alone policy, there was no EU position on this. We fast forward it to 2014. Uh, Russia. Yes, still, you know, fairly important divisions over Russia. But we were able to cobble together a position and a policy which was basically sort of giving an ear to both sides of the argument. You know, those that wanted dialogue, those that wanted sanctions, the stick and the carrot. Uh, and ultimately, it was a policy. Mm, and one can discuss how effective or non-effective it is, but it was a policy. And now we for, sort of fast forward it to today and still stick with the Russia example. I think that when it comes to in sort of internal EU positions on Russia, actually, there's been quite an important amount of convergence. And it's been converging towards a tougher line, I think, towards Russia, now largely because of what Russia itself has been doing. But if I observe the debate in my own country, Italy, this was a country that six years ago talked about strategic partnership with Russia, even after the annexation of Crimea. Now Russia is not discussed in these terms at all. Largely, as I said, because of the consequences of what Russia has done, both in terms of instrumentalizing the migration debate in Italy and therefore the whole sort of disinformation debate, all of a sudden it became ob 
obvious that this was not just some paranoia coming from Eastern Europe. It was kind of real and it was happening in different places and in different ways. It was partly because of what Russia has been doing in Libya. But I would say that the debate in Italy on Russia has been converging with the rest of a European consensus. So, you know, then obviously when it comes to other matters, I mean, Turkey, for instance, I would say that at different points in time, divisions that have always been there become, you know, at times they go through phases of being slightly more latent and then at times they sort of re-explode again. That there has always been problem, if you like, in sort of French understanding of what Turkey's European journey uh, was going to be is not something that we've learned now. It is something that has been with us for decades. It has simply sort of times things happen that simply make something more acute. But there has been a sort of Cyprus issue <laughs> ever since a divided Cyprus entered the European Union and the way in which that was going to condition EU policies towards Turkey is always also something that we've known for the last 16 years. So, you know, some things don't necessarily change, but I think on other matters, there has been a degree of important convergence. And I think it's important to recognize that. So five or six years ago, before Crimea was annexed, before the Ukraine war blew up, or even shortly after that, right, the big debate, the big security challenge for Europe was one of refugee flows and migration. How do you think Europe has done on that looking back over the last five or six years and also looking at it from the standpoint of COVID crisis and everything else that's happened since? I think that a solution to the migration, I don't like the word crisis, because if you just kind of look at the numbers, talking about this as a crisis and a union of 500 million people gives me sort of goosebumps. But OK, the sort of migration phenomenon oh, or even the migration challenge, I accept the challenge. This is a solution that has at least three pillars to it. So there's certainly an external one, but there's a border management piece and there's an internal piece. And I think in fairness, when it comes to the external side, there has been some movement. There has been an attempt at engaging transit countries and origin countries on migration. I think we're still a long way away from properly integrating migration into a broader sort of foreign policy approach towards origin countries and in a sense offering origin and transit countries a sort of quote-unquote social contract, which is not just good for us, but is also good for them, which is in a sense the only guarantee that we have that it will actually be implemented, huh? which means sort of having deals with these countries that sort of include a trade, an aid, a security cooperation, a political dialogue aspect, as well as a migration management aspect. So we're still a long way away sort of getting there, but I think there has been important movement in that respect. Some movement obviously has also happened on the border management side. The main problem, though, is not foreign policy related. Uh, the main problem and there where we're still terribly stuck is on the internal aspect. And unless we find a solution to that, but it's not, as I said, it's not foreign policy. It's, uh, it's very much internal rather than external. We are never going to get anywhere because it's an illusion to think that the migration challenge is something that can simply be addressed effectively by sort of striking deals to keep the migrants and refugees out. Natalie, that is just uh, really, I feel like we could do an entire podcast on this alone, only on any of the topics we've talked about today, but we're out of time, very sadly. So um, I hope we can one way or another continue this conversation. But for now, thank you so, so much for joining us. Lovely talking to you. So audience, listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. And we encourage you, I encourage you to read Natalie's work on Politico and elsewhere and to follow her on Twitter. She's at Natalie. Natalie Tochi, uh, simple enough. It's just her name. And for any more crisis group work on Europe and Central Asia, and indeed on the United States, which we've recently started covering as a potentially violent place, do just check out our website, uh, www.crisisgroup.org. And you can, of course, follow Crisis Group on Twitter. It's at Crisis Group. And you can follow Hugh and me. Hugh is at Hugh underscore Pope. And I'm at Olya, O-L-Y-A, Oliker, O-L-I-K-E-R, all one word. And you should check us out on Facebook and Instagram, where we are also at Crisis Group. And of course, please do feel free to tweet at us or about what you like or don't like in the podcast. We will be paying attention and we will listen. If you're listening through iTunes, perhaps leave us a rating or a review as well.
War and Peace is a partner in a network of podcasts about Europe. Europod. Check them out. Check out the Europod site for some of the others. And a big thanks to our producer, Bull Media, and to Rebecca Zirihun Asifa, who makes sure that Olya and I know what we're doing every time we record one of these episodes. And the biggest thanks, as always, go to you, our listeners. We look forward to chatting with you some more in two weeks, at which point we will almost certainly, maybe, know who the next president of the United States is. Definitely. Thanks and goodbye. Goodbye. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group.